you've carried out lots of mass participation studies. What is a mass participation study? And maybe you could uh, answer that by giving giving some examples or any example that comes to mind. So mass participation studies, as the, <laughs> the name suggests, is studies involving lots of people. <laughs> right. And it was a life-changing experience for me uh, surrounding my very first one. So I got to University of Hertfordshire after studying at Edinburgh. And I think within a couple of weeks, sitting at my desk, this email came round, because email had been invented by then, uh, from the, uh, the BBC. And uh, it said, we're, we're going to be doing a mass participation experiment as part of Science Week in the UK. And uh, we haven't got any ideas for what, what we should do. So we're, we're emailing all scientists and psychologists, anyone got any ideas? And it would have been the easiest email to have just deleted and thought, well, you know, there's thousands of people getting that. But at the time, I was working on the psychology of lying, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be fun to suggest that uh, politicians from the three main political parties, which we had in the UK at the time, went on television, and they lied and tell, told the truth, and then the public voted on which they thought was the lie, and we could work out which party had got the best liars. <laughs> and I, and I, I sent it in. I sent it in. It must have taken me, I don't know, 30 seconds to write that email. And it changed my life because about two weeks later, Simon Singh, who's a, a very big author and uh, mathematician, uh, was working at the BBC at the time, phoned me up. He said, I'm working on Tomorrow's World, which is the TV program that, that this is going to go out on. And we've chosen yours as the winning study. This is going to be a mass participation study. We're going to get the whole country trying to detect lies. And so we contacted the political parties, said, will you come on and lie and tell the truth? And they all said, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's Shock. ridiculous. Shocker. Shock, that's right. So we thought this is the end of the study. And then we eventually decided uh, to convince a very well-known political interviewer over here at the time, Sir Robin Day, who I think was kind of Walter Cronkite figure would be the sort of equivalent in, in the States, yeah. to come and lie and tell the truth. So he goes onto national television. I interview him twice, once he's lying, once he's telling the truth, and we open the phone lines. And we had no idea whether like 10 people were going to phone in or 15. We got about 30,000 people. In, <laughs> it was incredible in about 10 minutes. And this is all in a live TV program. And so I had to look at those results as they come in, turn them around very quickly, and then interpret the results on TV. And the, uh, the fact of the matter was that when we watch people lie and tell the truth on video or film or TV, we're really not very good at detecting a lie. And the, the results supported that, about 50-50. There's a chance split. Uh, however, we'd also run two other parts of the study. We'd broadcast just the audio on national radio, and we'd put the transcripts into a national newspaper. And when you focus people's attention on the verbal cues, which is where the really good stuff is in terms of uh, signals for lying, they become much better lie detectors. So that 50% went up to about 60, went up to about 70% accuracy just when you read the transcripts or you listened to it on the radio. Because suddenly all the ums and the ahs and the lack of detail, the lack of eyes, me, my, and so on, they all jump out at you. Where when you're overwhelmed with visual information, you just don't spot that. And that was my first ever mass participation experiment. And because of that, they came back to me year after year and I invented loads of them for them. All right. I want to hear more examples, but... Could you explain or elaborate on the lack of I, me, mine as an indicator? With lie detection, I've done quite a bit of it over the years. What you're looking for are movements away from what's called the baseline. We've all got a sort of signature in terms of how much eye contact we, we, we make when we're talking or whether we say the words I, me, mine or adjectives or whatever. And once you've established that baseline, what you see is that liars have a fairly consistent pattern of movement against that baseline. So one is a lack of detail, shorter sentences, bigger response time, which is the time between the end of a question and the beginning of an answer, and also a psychological distancing. They don't like saying me, my, I, all those sorts of things which wrap them up in the story. And, and so it's a, it's a good little hint and tip as somebody, you know, it's evidence that somebody might be uh, lying to you. 